Hi everybody, Dr. Friedman here, and this is a recap of our wide-ranging discussion on persuasion. This is a week with no supplementary reading because we are focused on a journal article praise and a journal survey assignment. And so I wanted to make sure that there was space for that. A reminder to students that I'm really looking for these tasks to be completed ideally before fall break. And if you need the time by Monday after fall break, um, the deadline is flexible for both. So try not to freak out. These are process documents and I understand. There aren't a whole lot of games in Persuasion and Persuasion is another one of the novels that alongside Mansfield Park is remarkably difficult to adapt. And as we noted in class today, there have been attempts in Razama's uh, Mansfield Park and the recent modern adaptation that's still set in the Regency of persuasion with Dakota Fanning, the way that they make these quiet heroines palatable to modern audiences is by having them do things like break the fourth wall so that they seem sly as opposed to retiring, that everything is kind of behind a little bit of an ironic mask. And that doesn't really work. Um, there are lots of ways that we discussed that would be possible to think about the obstacles that Anne and Frederick face that could work in a modern version. There are plenty of novel modernizations that take advantage of the fact that in the 21st century, we have much more in Western culture of an expectation that your first love isn't necessarily the person that you're going to marry. And so leaning on that possibly in conversation with questions of class and wealth f is the engine for a lot of modern adaptations. That said, the novel itself is full of branching narratives. Not to say that there's a kind of choose your own adventure quality to persuasion, but in a novel that is really centered on the question of a choice made in the past and the reverberations of that choice. We see echoes in other plot lines and pairings and people of the lives Anne and Frederick could have lived. Maybe they could have been the Crofts, or perhaps they would have ended up like Captain Bewick and his now dead fiance who died while waiting for a marriage that couldn't come to pass until the promotion that came too late. And of course, as we've been talking across this whole semester, we also know the kind of echoes that come from an intertextual knowledge of Austin's plots. Very easily, Anne Elliot could have become like Fanny Price's mother, although Maybe not. I also mentioned the evidence of real life, which is to say the evidence that survives from the Foundling Hospital Museum and the tokens that were left by parents who hoped to someday be reunited with the children they could not currently care for. Many of the narratives tell of sailors' wives who either became widows or just could not continue to care for their children in the absence of their partner. There's a lot of ways in which this, the one of two posthumous novels of Austen, really is a reflection and a kind of kaleidoscope of thinking about reading and narratives and lives that could have been lived in all kinds of ways and persuasion more than any. It is also worthwhile, as I suggested to students, to think about the ways in which the most emotionally rich territory at the both the beginning and the end of the novel, the frame, 
is female friendship. We are given, and we closely read today, um, the baronetage that opens up this novel. All of these novels have begun by situating the heroines within their families of origin and the place, but none so coldly, perhaps, as this one, which literally references a document that fits in the palm of Sir Walter Elliot's hand. It is a duodecimo volume in that way, and it is well-worn and annotated. And it gives us dry facts, which I also prompted students to think about in terms of what the historical record, and indeed this gives us precision of dates so that we can contextualize the ways in which the ages of these children when they lose their mother, their mother who has a first name but no surname, no maiden name, we do not know when she was born, so we do not know how old she was when she died and what she died of. It's not of childbirth, at least we are not led to think so by the ages of both her living and deceased children. In many ways, she is a mystery aside from her love of Lady Russell, who relocated to be near her at some unspecified point. And it wasn't to become the next Lady Elliot. It, that is a fate that Lady Russell firmly refuses. She has the means to do whatever she wants as a widow in her own right, and yet she chooses to help raise these three girls. And it is that effective tie that is the persuasion that convinces Anne to choose the route of remaining in right relationship with that family, as well as her biological family, and not try to, you know, make it work with Wentworth, if it was even possible to make it work when they were so young and so without resources, especially if Anne is abandoned by her family. She would really much be like um, Fanny Price's mother in that respect. I cannot stress this enough. And at the end, it is notable that the final paragraph, too, does not begin with Anne's happiness, but the happiness of her friend, Mrs. Smith, who is now still an invalid, still not in the best of health, but has the resources and support and affection that she needs. One can only think of Austin not long from her own death thinking about this as an interesting kind of wish fulfillment we do not always really prioritize. I had some questions in class about kind of biographical data, and I admitted that this is a little bit of an intentional or purposeful hole in my own kind of training or um, scholarly interest. While I am deeply interested in the ways that Austin thinks about the body, uh, the way that Austin thinks about systems in the world around her, and I can't help but know certain kinds of things about her family, I have not dug deeply into all the ways in which Austin might be using her world, her life, and the world of her family and the world around her in order to inform her narrative. We'll see if students find other things. And so this was a kind of uh, day of me really kind of lobbing bombs into the middle of discussion. Uh, and so I'll lob those to you. Um, and just so you know, this is one of those weeks where we did not have perfect attendance. So this is indeed addressed to my students. Um, is Anne right at the end that she shouldn't have made any other choices? Did she always think that? Or are her emotions a little less stable than she even knows? In the famous debate between her and Harville, is she right? It, does Austin think that she's right? Um, it's a very biologically determined exchange about the nature of men and women's love, in addition to being kind of culturally situated in all kinds of ways. Is Austin trying to 
draw a very specific and strong moral in terms of the regulating of our sympathies or is she providing a more complex kind of moral case study for us to look at in all its different facets and refractions i'm personally inclined to think the latter but if it can be defended with evidence from the text i am always inclined to listen more so that's a taster and I think a pretty broad overview of some of the issues that we talked about, the salient issues that we talked about in class today. In terms of housekeeping, we do not have class next week because it is fall break. So please, for the love of God, rest. The week after that, we will explore Austin inspired games and I drew students attention in particular uh, to the lady's choice as the most robust of the examples, but there are lots available, especially for folks who are thinking about final assignments that involve twine. We do have some secondary reading in that one. And then we will look at uh, the stuff that we haven't yet read because it's the unpublished material. Uh, we'll look at the juvenilia and students will have their selection of what they want to dip into from the juvenilia. We'll look at Lady Susan, the early epistolary novel, my favorite bad girl, as well as the unfinished The Watsons and Sanditon. So lots that's coming up ahead, and uh, I'm excited about all of that. The goal is that readings will decrease in length from here on out because there's more independent work that students are doing towards their final portfolios be they ending in some kind of creative work with a critical introduction or whether they are a full-fledged article. But for now, we rest. See you soon. <laughs>